work it, make it, do it, make sense. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about microservices, their history, how to create them, and communicate between them. But first, let's learn a little more about each other. My name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana for 16 years with no electricity and no running water. True story. It's funny that I'm a computer guy now. Um, we used to actually have to heat up the stove in my parents' cabin, which was their bedroom, to warm up the monitor and then start the generator and then get the Commodore 64 going and then you could connect, right, over a 300 baud modem to the internet. So even though we were out there, um, my dad still had Byte Magazine coming in and he was into computers, so I ended up in computers as well. I've lived in Denver since 1992 and uh, I like to ski, I like to mountain bike, and I love good beer. And I'm very happy to be here. So what about you? How many people are using microservices right now? Okay, it's about 50% of the room. How many people are using Java EE for that? That's six people. How many people are using Spring Boot? Okay, that's about 40% of the room. Um, anyone using it with Eureka? Okay, a couple of you. Um, and uh, anyone using JHipster? We got one. All right. Two. Three. All right. The goal by the end of this is two more will be motivated to try it. Anyone doing .NET programming? Nope. Python? We got one. Two. Okay. Um, anyone using uh, Java 8 and um, Logum? A couple of you. Anyone using Scala and Logum? Same people, they're like, yeah, we use both. Uh, what about Drop Wizard? Two, three, okay. Uh, anyone using Vertex? The microservices? Three or four? Okay. So, microservices, it's a funny story, it's an interesting history. Uh, it actually was first used as a common architecture term at a workshop of software architects near Venice in May 2011. And in May 2012, the same group decided microservices was a more appropriate name. So they changed it from microservice to microservice says, right? They pluralized it. Took them a year to do that. Um, but that's the definition from Wikipedia. The most interesting thing is the term micro web services was first used at a cloud computing expo in 2005, Dr. Peter Rogers. And Juval Lowry had similar precursors ideas. He worked at Microsoft about classes being granular services as the next evolution of Microsoft architecture in 2007. So this has been around for 10 years. And he basically said services are composed using Unix-like pipelines. The web meets Unix or true loose coupling. Services can call services. You can have multiple language runtimes. Complex service assemblies are abstracted behind simple URI interface. Any service at any granularity can, can be exposed. So that sounds very similar to our current definition of microservices. It just wasn't really given a lot of credit, you know, in the general mainstream. And that's because of these guys. So on the left, we have James Lewis, top left. Then we have Martin Fowler and Adrian Cockcroft and Joe Wallen. So James Lewis presented some of the ideas behind microservices in 2012 at the 33rd degree conference in Krakow. And his talk was called Microservices Java the Unix Way. And Fred George is credited with sharing similar ideas. And then Adrian Cockcroft, who is at Netflix, described the architecture as fine-grained SOA. And so he's the one who pioneered kind of the style at WebScale. And basically they created a lot of open source projects at Netflix that Spring Cloud wraps to make you know, it easier for Spring developers. And so then the real definitive article didn't come out until March 25th, 2014, when Martin Fowler and James Lewis wrote the title just simply Microservices. And years later, this is still considered, right, the definitive guide for microservices. And so in that, he talks about, you know, how technologies have been traditionally organized into technology layers, right? You have your DBAs, you have your testers, you have your production people, now they're DevOps. Right? And when teams are separated along these lines, even simple changes can lead to a cross-team project taking time and budgetary approval. It's just difficult right, to get it through each stage into production. And so a small team will optimize around this and choose the lesser of two evils, forcing the logic into whichever application they have access to. So that's where you get DBAs you know, doing stored procedures. That's where you get Java people saying, we're not doing anything in the database, we do it all in code. Right? And so this has kind of led 
to difficulties with teams, and so it's an example of Conway's law in action. And Conway's law is any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So one of the things that's interesting here is what they're saying is if you have very segmented teams that do one function, like UI developers, back-end developers, then chances are that's how your architecture is going to evolve. But if you have teams around products, right, like the um, store, right, or the blog, or whatever it might be, then chances are you're going to have DBAs on there, you're going to have project managers on there, you're going to have DevOps people, and then you can have this microservices architecture where your code is separate from everyone else's and it communicates through these URI interfaces. So the philosophy of a microservices architecture essentially is similar to the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it well. It's easier to work on small do one thing services and no single program represents the whole application. So as long as the services use a lightweight agnostic protocol, for instance HTTP or async messaging, then applications can be written in anything, Java, Ruby, Node, Go, whatever. And the platform as a service providers, right, have made it really easy to deploy microservices. It wasn't always this easy. So all the technologies needed to support a monolith, such as load balancing and discovery and process monitoring, are provided by the PaaS outside of your container. So not only for a monolith, but for you know, microservices. And the deployment effort becomes zero. Right? Now that we have Docker and Kubernetes and stuff like that, it's very easy for us to move you know, from one cluster to another and deploy all these microservices. So the question is, are microservices the future? And I think architecture decisions are usually only evident several years later after you make them. And so microservices have been successful at companies like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix. Right? So that doesn't mean they'll be successful at your organization just because they've been successful at these organizations. Because component boundaries are hard to define. So if you're not able to create your components cleanly, you're just shifting the complexity from inside your application to a distributed environment and you're putting it on the network. And also team capabilities is something to consider. So if you have a poor team now, you will always create a poor system. So hire well. So you shouldn't start with a microservices architecture. Instead, begin with a monolith, keep it simple, and split it in a microservice once the monolith becomes a problem. And when I worked at LinkedIn in 2007 and 2008, we had this monolith that was very big, and it basically, I remember starting all the Jetty services they had to run in the back end, there were 63 of them. And then you had to start the web app, which was its own app. And it used Ant to build. And it was modular code base, but it all ended up in the same war. And it took 20 minutes to build. Right? And the cool thing was we all got Mac Pros. Right? But the unfortunate part was when four of us were in a small room using them, it got hot in there. Right? Because everyone was running. And you make one mistake and you got to rebuild everything. It was terrible. We tried OSGI to solve the problem. That didn't work. Um, but you know, it's funny. One of the lead architects actually had a, a moment of clarity in the shower one morning and realized that, hey, you can run parallel tasks in Ant. Right? And he got the build down to like four minutes, and then we didn't care anymore. Um, now it's a very much microservices architecture at LinkedIn. They have hundreds of play framework apps. They have hundreds of node apps. And they've really, you know, it's taken them 10 years to get there. but. Um, it's very much allowed them to scale. And the biggest reason, obviously, is because of people. Like, it's really hard to have 100 people working on the same code base. So if you split it into microservice, then it's easy for 5 or 10 people to work on their component and not have conflicts when they're committing code. So if you have a monolith and you want to migrate to microservices, you should definitely check out Spring Boot. It's a project that simplifies Spring configuration. And uh, you know, it makes it so a lot of the configuration, a lot of XML doesn't exist anymore. Um, it still has annotation hell, but that's better than XML hell. And uh, it allows you to create highly configurable applications that deploy easily. And don't just take my word for it. If you look at this report from last year, 2016 in October, 250% um, growth year over year, and it's continuing. So a lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon. I think a lot of the reason is because they were already developing with Spring, and they kind of want to move to a more modern things, and what they find out is they can delete a lot of code. So that makes sense. So I like to say that sales of Spring Boot skyrocketed 2016. So it's kind of become the on-off switch of enterprise Java. Um, everyone's using it and loves it, or at least a lot of Spring developers are. Um, you can create standalone Spring applications. You can embed Tomcat, Jetty, or Undertow. 
and you have all these pre-configured starter palms. So one of the issues you might have when you get into Spring Boot is they name all these starters dash starter, right? It's like JPA starter, it's a, you know, MongoDB starter, and you're like, why do they call it a starter? And it's basically because it just configures the dependencies for you. So instead of you having to specify Hibernate and Entity Manager and all these other things, um, you can just specify one and it pulls in those dependencies. So it makes your palms pretty small, nice, and compact. And then it's got Maven or Gradle support, and it's also got this thing called DevTools, which allows you to basically restart your application. If you just compile a single class, it'll restart it for you, and works pretty well some of the times. I seem to have this strange problem when I do demos. Um, like one out of two times, that DevTools will just restart and restart and restart, and I can never reproduce it after a demo. So maybe it has something to do with like a projector plugged in or something, but. So as Josh Long likes to say, start.spring.io is one of the happiest places on the internet. And I agree with him because if you're a developer and you're at this site, chances are you're doing a cool demo like this one, or you're actually starting a new project. You're not doing greenfield development, right? That's a really nice place to be as a developer. So you go to start.spring.io and you basically specify whether you want a Maven or a Gradle project, and then you specify the version of Spring Boot, you can type in your coordinates for your project metadata, and then you pick the things you want to pick. So in this example I have DevTools, I have H2 for an in-memory database, JPA, REST repositories, which allows me to take my JPA repositories and expose them as REST endpoints, and then Spring MVC. So I started my first real job last September. Um, for 20 years I was an independent consultant. I worked for Stormpath as a Java consultant, um, writing code for the Java SDK, and after working there for a couple of months, a few months, I really got to like the people a lot, and they basically talked me into taking a full-time job. So now I'm like most people, I have a full-time job, but the cool thing is I get paid to do stuff like this, right? And Stormpath basically has an API in the cloud that you talk to for doing authentication. So you embed the code into your project, and if using Spring Boot, it's three lines of a dependency for Maven, and then boom, you're up and running. And it's got login screens, it's got forgot password, all that, and then it talks to the cloud to authenticate you. So it makes it really easy for a developer. So StormPass microservices implementation is based largely on Cassandra and Kafka. Um, what we found was with HTTP, it was blocking, and it's a blocking protocol, so um, it would just didn't scale well for 100 million API requests a month. And so we moved to Kafka and then uh, used SAMHSA for real-time processing, and then Zookeeper to coordinate it all, and Elasticsearch was a big part of our architecture as well. And so everything was served up by Spring Boot, and we've been using Spring since day one. Um, and we had to rewrite a lot of the SAMHSA to work with Kafka, but, you know, it works nice. And what we were able to do is we were able to take the learnings from that migration to Spring Boot and actually create a starter so you could use um, SAMHSA with Kafka instead of Zookeeper. And so there's an open source project out there, you can go use it, and instead of doing, you know, five tedious steps to get started with uh, SAMHSA, you can now get started with just a Spring Boot starter. So Okta is the company I work for now, so it's funny, you take a full-time job and then six months later you work for a new company, it's kind of like consulting. So it was easy for me to transition to the new company. So Okta is the new company. We joined forces with them in February, and we did that so we could move faster. Basically, they created an API a year ago. We created an API five years ago. We really know developers well. We know how to create tools for them. And they said, we need your help, so now we're on the same team. So they still provide an API service that allows developers to create, edit, user accounts, all that in the cloud. And it makes user account management a lot easier and more secure and infinitely scalable. So before that, though, we migrated our backend at Stormpath to Spring Boot, and it was a lot of just deleting XML, right, and putting it into Java config classes. Um, it really made it really easy because we were able to, you know, put our config files in one place and know how they're looked up and all the auto configuration stuff. So the cool thing was we were able to take this high traffic site, you know, 100 million API calls a month, and basically migrate it in three weeks. So if you're already using Spring and you're not using Spring Boot, shouldn't be hard to migrate to a system that uses Spring Boot. What we discovered in the process, that microservices are awesome, but they're not free. So it requires a lot of organizational changes, and the biggest thing it requires is automation. So you have to think of products, right, for each microservices, not projects, which is like, hey, we're gonna, you know, build this by the end of the year. And so just to show you some code from a, a Spring Boot example, this is how you would create a simple REST repository. So if you're using Lombok, 
You wouldn't even need that comment that says getters and setters in two string. You could just add a, you know, annotation that says data at the top. And then you basically, in 10 lines of code, you have a REST endpoint with Spring Boot. So it makes it very easy to demo, right? It's awesome for demos because you just write a little bit of code and there you got a REST endpoint. But once you have a REST endpoint like this, what it's going to do is it's going to publish that at slash blogs because it takes the entity name and it pluralizes it. And then it has paging and sorting in there. You might want to put some data in it. So if you wanted to do that, you could do a command line runner. And then you basically override the run method. And you can take, you know, a stream of objects and create new blogs, essentially. And then print them out. So all that's pretty simple. Um, I didn't feel like, you know, getting out of the presentation and showing you a demo because I think most of you have seen that. But I will look at the code and I will show it um, when I get to the demo part. So as far as the microservices architecture with Spring Boot, it's a little bit different. Um, you'll use Spring Cloud. And like I said, Spring Cloud wraps a lot of these open source libraries that do monitoring and do service discovery and circuit breakers and intelligent routing and client side load balancing and does that for you. So um, Spring Cloud Netflix is the OSS integration for Spring Boot apps and it has auto configuration in there. So the service discovery is provided by Eureka. Um, the service breaker or the circuit breaker is Hystrix and then intelligent routing is from Zool and then client side load balancing is from Ribbon. And so one of the demos that I have today, I don't know if I'll be able to go into all the code, but I think it's, it's a pretty cool concept. So how many people are at the securing microservices session that Kate did just in the last session? A few of you. So we talked about, or they talked about JWTs in that session. And this architecture uses the same thing. So you'll make REST calls from a browser or from a phone. It'll hit an edge service and that edge service will be secured by Spring Security. That's what those little icons are, those little shields. And so what we've done both at Stormpath and at Okta is made it so all you really have to do is integrate Spring Security and drop in our dependency. And then you set some environment variables to say here's my application, you know, here's my development instance and then you're up and running. So the cool thing is if you can configure Spring Security to secure different endpoints, then you're securing the same thing, you know, with Okta. So all we're providing is the users essentially. So we're like your user memory and then you can create groups and all that and Spring Security recognizes all that and reads it. So there's another project in here that's kind of small, this little juicer guy, right? Looks like an orange there. So that is a new project that we released as 1.0 um, basically two weeks ago and that's created by Les Hazelwood, the CTO, former CPO of Stormpath and uh, he basically created this project that's really cool. You can take a JOT, JWT, the abbreviation JOT is actually in the spec and uh, you can take a JOT and you can put this juicer library into your project and it'll take that JOT from a Zool project or a Zool exported user header and create a spring security user object. So what that means is you can have things like catalog service that is actually a service that's not exposed to the endpoint but is still secured with JWTs and that service can still know who the user is. So one of the common patterns I've seen is to use something like this, uh, this spring security at the edge service but then not caring about the communication between the edge service and the catalog service for instance because it's behind a firewall. So this is a way of basically showing you that you can use JOTs and that catalog service doesn't have to talk back to Okta. It can if it wants, um, but basically use public private key pairs to say, hey, here's a JWT. I'm going to put it in X forwarded user header. And then this juicer library takes it out of the header, creates a spring security object, and you're authenticated. So if you don't go through that route, then what's going to happen is basically access denied, right? Because it doesn't accept any old login. Um, it only accepts that X forwarded user header. So you can secure your API, but the most important thing to you is obviously TLS. It used to be called SSL, right? Transport security layer. And that's the number one thing. And even Chrome in the next year is going to start like warning big time about non-HTTPS sites. And there could even be a drop in your ranking very soon. Um, it's already happening for mobile. So if you're developing a customer facing application, definitely consider that. And with Let's Encrypt, you can get a certificate for free, so why not, right? Everyone should be using SSL or TLS. So OAuth 2 is one of the most popular authorization frameworks. It allows a third party application to obtain limited information about its owner and orchestrate an approval, you know, between the interaction and the HTTP service. So 
Um, it obsoletes the auth, OAuth 1.0 protocol, um, but there's also OpenID Connect that's built on top of that. And that's one that Google's using a lot and they're championing it a lot, so um, their API supports it if you're doing social login. Um, one of the things that we do at Okta is you can use social login like Facebook, Google, um, you know, GitHub, but instead of you configuring and have to worry about that, you just set it up in your Okta instance and then your users get it as another button on their login form. So another thing to consider is API keys versus username password authentication. Uh, API keys are usually a little better, but you have to store them securely, so make sure whatever directory they're in or however you're storing them, make sure those are locked down. Another good idea that they discussed in the last session was using just your HTTPS certificate, right? It has a private key and it has a public key, so you can use that to sign your jots and then the public key to decrypt it. And then make sure you use global unique IDs. And avoid sessions, especially in URLs. So jots, here's how they look. They basically have a header, and then they have a body, and then they have a signature. And so it's a secure and trustworthy standard for token authentication. And they allow you to digitally sign information, which is often called claims, with a signature and can be verified at a later time with a secret signing key. So one of the problems that typically happens with OAuth 2 is OAuth 2, all it has to do is return a token, right? It's just a random string. But the cool thing is, is so is JWTs, but it's not just random. There's actually more information in there, right? So instead of just being a random string that's, you know, verified, you can actually parse it. You can look at the expired time. You can look at if it's not good before this date. And the JWT libraries out there will actually blow up if any of it's just not matching or if the signature doesn't match. So the claims tell you at a, million, at a minimum who this person is, what the URI to the, the resource is from, and what the person can access with their token and when the token expires. So usually you have short-lived tokens for access tokens and then you have refresh tokens that are maybe longer lived, like 30 days. And access tokens are two hours or 12 hours. And so to create a, a JOT in Java, this is from the Java JWT library, also created by Les Hazelwood of Stormpath. Um, we run that project and he's also the Apache Shiro guy, so he's been into security for 10 years. He's done great things for Java. So this is how you would create a new JOT and you can see we're setting the date there, we're setting the name and scope, and then we're signing it with a signature algorithm and the worst key you can use ever. This is what 90% of the examples out there use though, secret. A word that you can easily memorize and it doesn't even fill up HS256 close, right? So this is like one of the worst Anna patterns in JOTS. Never use a key that you can remember easily. Should be a long random string, it should fill up whatever that algorithm is and uh, make sure it's big. And then to validate a JWT, you get, you know, from the authorization header for instance and you parse it, you set the signing key again, another bad example, and then you get the body and you can see, you know, what scopes they're in, what groups they're in, things of that sort. So, um, Never make a human readable word as your secret. Um, six bytes long is terrible. And uh, it's, you know, code smell to have human readable. And if you ever see get bytes on a string, that's also kind of a code smell. So a better secret would be some sort of base 64 encoded secret. And then you sign it with that and it's at least a little bit bigger. So Spring Boot is pretty hip. And so are microservices and JOTs. But what about the UI? The other hot framework out there not only, you know, React and Vue, but Angular. And wouldn't it be hip if someone combined all these, right, and made a framework that, you know, put them together? And maybe use something like Bootstrap in there, because that's cool too? So Jay Hipster actually did that. So Julian Dubois in October 2013 um, created this Jay Hipster project, which basically is an application generator. And once you actually have used Angular and you've used Spring Boot, and you've used Maven or Gradle, and you've figured out how all these work together, you never want to do it again, right? You're <laughs> like, that project is great, I'm going to keep that one in my Dropbox, and every time I move to a new client, I'm going to look at that project and see how we did it there. Well, the JHipster, you don't have to do it because it generates a project for you, and it has, like, all those best practices in there. So I worked for two years as an independent consultant and knew about JHipster and wrote a book on it and everything, but I never used it at a client because... Basically, why would they hire me if they just use JHipster, 
right? Because it could do all the work that I do. But I used it as an example of everything. So when they were like, how do we do this? I would show them, right? You generate a new project. Here's how you find out how to do that. So a very good reference on how to do things. And so at its core, it's just a yeoman generator, right? It's one of these projects that just generates other projects. Um, but it's becoming more of a platform because we're getting into microservices and we can generate microservices now. So just jhipster by the numbers. The reason I really like it as an open source project is it's not really controlled by one company. The only person you can buy a license for jhipster from is me. I'll sell you whatever you want. You can pay me lots of money. And then I'll support it, you know, 24 by 7 kind of thing. No, I actually met a guy in Atlanta a month ago, two months ago, that he couldn't use jhipster because his company couldn't buy a support license. So I told him, I'll sell you one. So it's, it's very much 250 contributors all over the world. Uh, Epon does put a lot of developers on it, and it's great because they'll bring new developers onto their company and then train them as jhipster developers, and then after a while they become, you know, part of the organization. But there's no one that, like, you know, manages the project from a company perspective. 6,800 GitHub stars, 480,000 installations from NPM since we created it. And there's 150 companies officially using it, all the way from Google and Heroku to others. So um, a lot of people are using it. You install it with npm install dash g generator, jhipster, then you make a directory, you cd into it, and you run yo jhipster. The number one mistake you're going to make is not creating a directory and cding into it. You're going to run yo jhipster in your home directory, and you're going to have all kinds of dot files that get put in there. So don't do that. Um, we've tried to actually put prompts when we create a project to say, here's where it's going to be created. So you notice that, um, but it still happens every once in a while. So that's a little bit different from like Maven archetypes where we're used to creating a project and it creates a directory for us. Similar with Angular CLI, it'll create a directory for us. Yo does not. So make sure you remember that. So it generates a Spring Boot application, it generates an Angular application, generates liquid based changelog files, which basically allows it to create your database schema for you. Um, but the cool thing is you can actually modify like an entity, add a new field, and run a Maven or Gradle command, whichever build system you're using, and it'll generate a changelog file that adds that column to your database. So you can do refactoring of your entities and of your system that way. And then for security, there's login, logout, forgot password, account management, user management. And uh, it's useful for most applications, so you might have to go there and tweak some stuff. And you know, chances are, if you create a brand new application with it and you don't tweak anything, you don't add a new bootstrap theme or anything, like it's going to be kind of boilerplate, right? And people that know jhipster are going to be like, "You didn't even try, right?" Because it just generates CRUD screens for you. So obviously, that's not going to be the end user functionality you want to put out there. Um, but it's a great start, and it kind of gets you out of that boilerplate coding. So good examples of working screens, forms, directives, validation, all that from, you know, Angular. Um, it's got monitoring, health monitoring, very useful in production. And then, like I said, the liquid base change files. So pretty nice. But also with, uh, with version 3, which has been out a year now, we allow you to develop microservices. So you can see here that we're leveraging, you know, Docker and Spring and Netflix. And basically we have a registry that's driven by Eureka on the left there. Um, you can also use HashiCorp's console if you want. And then there's a gateway. And that gateway basically can have entities and can have a database associated with it, or it can just be your API management gateway. And that uses Zool to proxy the requests to the microservices in the back end. So you can have one to many microservices, or you can have you know, some services on that gateway. If you generate code for your microservices on the back end, you're still going to want a UI for it. So you'll generate that on the front end, and I'll show you how to do that. And then you can use the Elk stack, Elastic, Logstash, and Kibana to actually monitor your application and see how it's performing. So this is what it looks like when you generate an application. And basically, you get prompted whether you want to do a monolith or a microservice. So let's see what that looks like. Everyone can see it okay? You need it bigger in the back? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, so because of Angular 4 and because of Webpack, things actually take longer to build on the client side now than on the server side. So we've come full circle now, um, and, uh, and you can get more coffee breaks and stuff like that. So that's a good thing. So if you see here, I have, I have three windows. 
This first one is the JHipster registry. So that's the Eureka server that you're going to need to have running for any services to talk to. So you'll notice the difference between the Angular JS version and the Angular 4 version. Angular JS basically takes just Java files and doesn't compile them into anything, right? It can optimize them, right? And concatenate them together and stuff like that, but it doesn't generate anything. So in JHipster 3, you could basically pull this JHipster registry, JHipster registry 2.0, put it in your project and just run it, right? MVN, and it would start up and run, and it would have all the Angular files in there and everything. We've recently rewritten it for Angular 4, and you'll notice here I had to clone it and then I had to build it. But I, what I really had to do is install like the yarn or the NPM dependencies and then compile it. Well, that took eight and a half minutes. And my laptop's not slow, right? But terrible demo. So at least I didn't do that to you. So we'll start that up just with uh, MVNW using the Maven wrapper. And then the other thing I did was I generated this blog application. So this blog application took 11 and a half minutes to generate. So just to show you, so you have kind of some ideas of, of what can be done here. I'm going to make my screen a little bit bigger. We'll do 720. There we go. So I'll just make, you know, a blog directory, CD into it, and then do YoJ Hipster. And I won't let it complete. I just want to show you kind of some of the choices you get when you create a new application. So if you happen to be using a version of the generator that's not the latest version, you'll actually be prompted right when you start to say, hey, there's a newer version if you want to use that. But basically you can create a monolith, which is just a Spring Boot application that has your Angular app inside it. And it uses Maven or Gradle uh, plugin tools. So there's a, a Gradle node plugin. And for Maven, there's a front end plugin. So when you do the production build, it builds all that and optimizes all that for you. You can see here, you can do a microservice or a gateway. So I'll just choose gateway. I'll name it blog. Um, you can install other generators from the JHipster marketplace. So we have a whole marketplace now. And uh, it detects that you're running in a microservice architecture. So what port would you like to run on? Your default package name. And then uh, do you want to use the JHipster registry or you can use the console which is in beta. You can use JWT authentication. You can also use the JHipster UAA server standing for user authorization and authentication. And it's still a separate server so if you need that, that's available. And then SQL or NoSQL databases. So MongoDB, Cassandra for NoSQL and then all the SQL ones. So what I chose was Postgres for production, H2 for development, and then Maven and then search engine with Elasticsearch. In development, it'll just put the index in your target directory. In production, you'll have to set up nodes and stuff like that. And then AngularJS is the production default version. Um, Angular 4 is in beta still. Um, but you can use SAS, say yes there. Internationalization, you can do English and, you know, something like Danish. And then Gatling and Protractor. So those are the choices I made when I generated the initial app. So then it goes through there and it generates a bunch of files but then it does the yarn install and that's what really takes a long time, right? Or npm install. Like if you thought Maven was bad and download the internet, like npm installs everything. Like it says, hey, internet, come on over and bring your friends. And then it sits there and takes 11 minutes to create the application. So we have this one created. We also have the store application. The store one is just a microservice. So what I did for that is I used MongoDB and I just said, you know, create this microservice application. Doesn't really matter what you name it because it's just an empty shell and then you need to put code into it. So for this blog one, what we can do is there's this JDL Studio. So JDL Studio is a pretty neat project that allows you to basically create your entity diagram in your browser. So y there is the possibility of going yo jhipster colon entity and then like a blog and it'll prompt you for everything. It'll say, hey, do you want to add a field, you know, to this entity? What do you want to name it? What type do you want it to be? What kind of validation rules do you want to have? Um, but that's kind of tedious, right? It takes a little while. So this guy's sucking up all my bandwidth back here. I'm going to close that one. Um, this JDL Studio allows you to basically create everything in here and then specify, you know, if it's required, what type it is, text blob because it's a large, you know, entry field, and then tags, relationships, and entries. So you can set up all that and then it shows you a little diagram and you can download it. 
So it puts it in your downloads directory and then you can do yoj hipster import jdl, point to the file. And it'll basically import all those and generate CRUD for it. You'll notice here it asked me if I want to overwrite the master liquid-based file. You want to say yes because it's adding, you know, new tables and everything like that in there. And then it's going to go ahead and build that and update the client app. So on the store we're going to want some entities too. So here we can just do the simple way. We can say product. Can't drag that one up as easy. Um, do you want to add a field to the entity? Yes. Name is just a uh, name and it's a string. We'll say it's required. Minimum length of two. And then uh, do you want to add another field? Yep. Price. Make that a big decimal. And then we'll say it's required as well. And then you can use a DTO if you want. You can wrap it around it. I'm not going to use one. I just like to keep things simple. And then you can also generate a service between your controller and your repository if you want. I'm just going to use the repository directly and I'll have some pagination in there. And so this one doesn't generate any client code, right? It's just server side code. Um, but at the same time, it is using MongoDB. So MongoDB, right? I don't really want to install that locally. So luckily it generates some Docker files for you in jhipster microservices. And here you can do Docker compose and point to source main docker and it's got MongoDB in there. And you can run that so when we start the application it actually works, right, because MongoDB is running. So we need to get our registry going here. Looks like it is. And then our blog app. And before we do our blog, we'll start our store. We have to generate the UI for it, right? So yoj hipster entity product and it knows we're in a microservices architecture so it says hey do you want to generate this entity from an existing microservice? So you say yep. And then enter the path to it. I've done this a couple times before so it remembers some of these things. That's why it's got dot dot store in there. Um, but if you were doing it for the first time it might not be in there and you'd have to type it in. And so the, the reason you'll do this is you can regenerate the entity then but it knows that it's only going to generate the, the client stuff. So I think this is funny. In the JavaScript world, like, we still don't have libraries that do, like, basic CRUD for us, right? And if we did, they would probably be big, right? Just like Spring is big and Spring Boot, right, and the rest repositories. Like, there's a lot of code behind those, but because of how Java works, we don't have to put it in our project. Well, um, we haven't done that in the JavaScript world. So when you generate, like, an entity and you have all its components, you end up with a bunch of different HTML files for each different action and then a whole bunch of TypeScript files as well. So we're going to overwrite that entity one. We'll overwrite Webpack. We'll just say all of them and then that'll build it. And so even if I was to go in and look at my store, there's no UI on it, right? There's nothing to see so I'm not going to be able to see anything. Um, but once this is up and running, I can, I can run that. So um, we'll just go MVN and hope that starts. We can look at our registry in the meantime. So localhost 8761 is the jhipster registry. And it's just got the default username and password of admin admin. And you'll see here it shows your application instances. So we have store which is up and running. And you can see like when things have joined and when they've not joined. So you can set a refresh time there. You can see all your cloud configuration if you're configuring things that way. Um, for your jots, for instance, for the secret keys. And then if you want to SSH into the server, you can. There's also metrics on the server itself. So you can see the JVM metrics. And this comes standard with any jhipster application. So it's got, you know, the HTTP requests, all the service statistics and all that. And then the help. So the different endpoints, you know, whether things are up and running and uh, all the different services that it provides. Just going to check if the database is coming up. Okay. But the cool thing is it actually allows you to talk to your other instances as well. So it pulls in the metrics from those so you can look at the health checks for the store for instance. And the blog is up and running or it's starting so you can kind of see what that looks like too. So it's a nice administration dashboard just for, you know, all of your stuff. And then you can look at logs. And this is kind of a neat feature of, of just jhipster in general. You can tweak these logs. You can set it to error right on the UI and it changes it in the console. It doesn't persist it, right, to a file. But if you're debugging something, it allows you to change that really easily. So now we should have localhost 8080 blogs up. 
Not yet. Right now it's just 8080. There's no. So there we are. We can sign in. And we have our entities that we created, right? We can say, hey, this is a new admins blog. And then we could create, you know, a blog post. Beautiful day. Is it still beautiful out? It was earlier. Beautiful day. Funny uh, trivia story. There's a Chipotle across the street. Did you know when I went to college 20 years ago, I lived on the same block as the first Chipotle? Now there's like thousands of them. I had to tell the people in there. They, they thought it was kind of cool, but not really. <laughs> Lunch at Chipotle. It was awesome. It felt like I was at home. So then you'd put a date in here. This is just using the native date picker. So we could say, you know, this is 1 o'clock p.m. And we'll put it on this blog. So it does all those relationships for you, right? And if we had tags in there, it would be in there too. And, uh, and then you could switch languages if you want. Obviously, your data won't be in a different language, but, you know, all of the everything else will be. So it's got the uh, user administration. It's got all those metrics, just like we saw in the gateway or on the registry. It's also got a Swagger API, right? If you just want people to code to your API, you could point them at this stuff. So it automatically generates those for each of the different entities that we generate. And then it's got an interface right to your database when you're using H2. So the cool thing is, though, it actually generated the product that talks to MongoDB. So this is an interesting problem that I've had. Even though I delete everything, um, I think it's because I need to delete like MongoDB within Docker itself. Um, if I've ever done this demo before, the, the data shows up, right? So I got to delete it there, and then I can, you know, create a new project, and we can say beer because it's close to five o'clock somewhere, right? And uh, and then you can see hey, it's a MongoDB data, right? Because it's got this key here. So you know, JHipster makes it very easy to connect to that. But we're also running, you know, in a environment where we had to start up all these different services. So let's see what it looks like if we use something like Docker. So with Docker, you can do make their Docker. We can close these other windows. We'll see the end of Docker, and you can do yo j hipster. And then we can even close this one, right? Because we don't need MongoDB anymore. Yoj hipster docker compose. And so there's this docker subgenerator, and it says what type of application would you like to deploy, a microservices one. It guesses that everything's in a uh, parent directory. And then we can select what applications we want to select. And then it knows that we're using MongoDB, so it says do you want to use cluster databases? I'm going to say no. And then do you want to set up monitoring? You can say no. But you can also use the JHipster console, which is similar to the registry in that the registry is a wrapper around the Eureka server that Spring provides. We just added some additional functionality, right? It's mostly UI based, but it also has some rate limiting and things like that in there. Um, the JHipster console is the same thing for the Elk stack. It just has some pre configured data in there. Um, you can also use Prometheus if you want. And then we're just going to use the default admin password. And so it generates this stuff, right? But it also knows that there's no Docker images for the various things. So this is the unfortunate slow part that we have to go build the Docker images. So jhipster microservices blog, and we have to run npm package, and then the production profile, so it optimizes everything, and then Docker build, or Docker colon build. And then we'll do one for the store as well. MVN package pprod docker build. So then you'll notice down here it says you can launch everything with just one command, docker dash compose up D. So while we're waiting for those to complete, you can also do Kubernetes. So you cd into that directory and you do yo j hipster Kubernetes. And this was written by Ray Tsang, right? Great guy from Google Cloud. Um, he helped us with this, and he actually, we spent an hour or two on a bus riding back from a ski resort at JFocus where he showed me how to take a JHipster application and deploy it to the cloud. So you know how buses are, right? They're bouncy. 
So every like 20 minutes, we'd have to stop and like let our stomach settle and then get back into it. But we were actually deploying to Google Cloud from our laptops on a bus in the remote wilderness. So that was kind of cool. And we made it happen. So um, I do have a YouTube screencast of basically doing a lot of the stuff we're doing here, but then deploying it to Google Cloud. The hard part is just building it and putting like your images on Docker Hub. Once that's done, like in Google Cloud, you go and create a project, you set your project, and then you deploy to it. And, uh, and you know, the long waiting time is for things to get to Docker Hub. So here it prompts you what type of application. Again, you select the different ones you want. And then for the Kubernetes namespace, I usually just use the default. Um, but for the base Docker repository name, that's whatever name you have on Docker Hub. So mine it personally is mrable. And it'll use that to generate the command you'll need. And then what command to use for Docker push. And so what it does is it prints all this out, right? Creates all these files for you for Docker. It notices that your blog still isn't a Docker image and tells you how to build that. And then you have to do Docker image tag and then you push it, right? And this is the part that doesn't really work well in a demo unless you're doing like cloud to cloud demos. Um, but since I'm on a laptop here, it, it takes a while to get to the cloud. But once it's there, you can run these commands, kubectl apply, and it'll deploy them all and you can scale them. You can also get the services and you could deploy it to Minikube. So we might do that if we have time here. I think we're close to done. Yeah, five minutes. So hopefully this guy will build. This is a new thing in uh, Angular 4. So some components, I think uh, this is one from maybe NG Bootstrap. No, it's NGJ Hipster. Uh, they recently renamed it. So you should use, if you're developing components with Angular, you should use ng-template instead of the raw template from uh, HTML5. Things will still work, but it, it's just a warning right now. Any questions in the meantime? Yeah. So what you would do is, that's part of the demo I skipped. Um, with the blog application, what I usually show is I show going in there and securing it. Like you, you wouldn't want to see other people's blogs, right? So you take those, for instance, a blog resource that you generate, instead of calling blog get all, you would go in there and secure it by saying find all for current user, right? And then the same thing with entries, you go in there and say find all for current user as well. And so you do tweak the business logic. And in my book, what I did is I basically showed how I could generate basically 80% of the code, but then once I turned it into the app I wanted, um, it basically required, you know, 2,000 more lines of code. But for the most part, it's not really Java code so much because we figured that out really well so far. It's mostly like the UI code that you want to make different, right? And you want to make dynamic. And the cool thing is using Yarn, you can do Yarn start and you use browser sync. And using the dev tools from Spring Boot, you could basically have that full round trip. You know, it's nice to have two monitors, um, but you're not really waiting for stuff to happen. You save a file, it recompiles, you know, your app reloads. Same on the UI. Like you save a file, it recompiles, it reloads, and it happens in a couple seconds for both of them. So the most important thing that I didn't show here was actually checking in your code to Git, right, before you generate everything. Because if you generate something and you didn't mean to, you're going to want to revert that. So usually that's what I do along every way is, you know, make sure I do that step where I'm, you know, checking in to Git and then generate something. Um, but at the same time, it's a really good tool for learning, right? You might not use it at your company, but if you want to know how to do jots with, you know, Angular and Spring Boot, it provides, you know, the code to do that. And then when I was at Stormpath, I wrote a plugin so you could just run this plugin to install Stormpath and it would replace the JOT authentication with Stormpath. And so I'll probably do that same thing for Okta, but it might not be to the end of the year. So this is still building. It's almost done. Man. So in the meantime, I did bring some books. And you guys can't make me take them home. So there's these Jay Hipster books. I got five of them. I'm not going to make you ask any hard questions or anything for them. Um, but it covers the 3.0 version. So Jay Hipster 4 came out in February. And the book was released in December, so it was current for like two months. So if you want to learn AngularJS, Spring Boot, here it is. But it shows you a lot of the, the business logic that I developed and, and how that works. So I'll just leave those up here if you want to come get one. There they are. So this is still building, but it's close. Any other questions?
Okay. So the question is, he's been using jhipster for a couple of years, he's on an older version, he wants to know is there a migration path between, you know, the older version and the newer version? Nope. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, you could use a diff tool, um, but the biggest problem is going to be the UI. It's just like AngularJS, right? They, they're like, if you want to use this ng upgrade tool, you can, but my experience in on jhipster was that if you use that, it's, uh, it's kind of painful, right? So um, it doesn't always work well. Um, but now we can do docker compose and we can do up and it'll basically start all our microservices. It'll start the registry, it'll start the console and you can look at everything. So um, our time is up so I will allow you to go but I will continue to do this and show some features of like the jhipster console and the elk stack. So thank you for coming.